Uh, thanks very much for um, letting me have a few minutes this morning. Uh, you know, it's, it's, having the morning slot is not my typical slot. Usually I get after lunch or actually doing the lunch and trying to get people focused uh, while they're trying to network and, and eat and what have you. But uh, this is great. First one out. So you're bright and fresh and got those eggs powering you forward with protein and what have you. Um, what I'd like to do um, before I go to my title is kind of give you just a brief reminder about who NIFA is. Um, we're obviously an agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The National Institute of Food and Agriculture is the uh, extramural funding arm for USDA. We are a small agency. We have 300 folks all located in one building uh, down in southwest uh, D.C., right across the street from all that new construction of the wharf. So if you've been to our office, we have actually, at least for the moment, we're, we have some pretty decent restaurants and some pretty decent hotels to, to serve you. And we, we welcome you to come and participate on our panels. It's probably the best way to understand who we are, what we do, and how we give out the $1.5 billion that we push back to you states. Uh, we all we have competitive grants, of course, and we have capacity grants that support the land grant institutions. But the, the interesting thing is that, I don't know if you've been watching our portfolio, but this last year, 2018, the water program took a little dive under the surface and became part of Sustainable Ag Systems, which was a big call that we had, uh, $80 million call, new initiative, focused on uh, the complete production cycle for agriculture. So not only water and irrigation and production of the actual crops, but all the way to processing and delivery and what have you. And so, and, and you'll notice that uh, what I'm talking about today are going to be projects that we have funded um, in the last five years. So we, there are two main uh, projects that um, are focused on the Great Plains, and, uh, and those are the ones that I'm gonna talk about and relate to you some of the issues that we've been talking about in Washington, D.C. that have actually gotten some traction in some of the issue areas in the Great Plains, particularly focused on the so southern Ogallala. So we have funded two excellent projects in these Great Plains states. The first one is sustaining agriculture through adaptive management to preserve the Ogallala Aquifer under a changing climate. That was for the, the Water for Agriculture Challenge area. That's the one that we uh, were able to roll out in 2014. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture actually rolled it out. It was quite an exciting um, period. We've spent um, almost $200 million under that challenge area. Um, that one is the AKA, it's also known as the AUCAP, the Ogallala Water Cap Project, which is focused, um, well, at least the project directors are at Fort Collins, and, and it is widely distributed with uh, participants. The other one is resilience and vulnerability of beef cattle production in the southern Great Plains under changing climate, land use, and markets, climate variability, and, and it's part of the climate variability and and change challenge area, which was an older challenge area. We used to have a long list during the Obama administration of different challenge areas. Climate change was one, um, childhood obesity was one, food safety, food security, uh, bioenergy, and then water. And so this climate change one supported this Southern Great Plains grazing project, which is, which is that long title is, that's their short version. And so when you Go to Google these things. You can Google the Alcap or the Ogallala Water Cap. Google the Southern Great Plains Grazing Project, and they have very nice websites with all of the different uh, newsletters and what have you. So these projects help to address a key Plains Great Plains issue: groundwater depletion. And what we've been kicking around back in Washington is this: is are the issues associated with the Southern uh, Ogallala, where uh, and involving New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma, where 90% of the water is used for irrigated agriculture. 
Um, the southern aquifer is predicted to be fully depleted by 2020, so we've got about 20 years, a little less than 20 years, maybe a little... <laughs> it's, it's worrisome. Uh, the rest of the Ogallala could be, if nothing changed, depleted to 60 to 80 percent by 2060, but um, this depletion represents a loss of about $20 billion per year. The highly irrigated land um, in the study area, and this study area is part of Bill Golden's study area, um, had a gross output of 240 per acre more um, when they fully irrigated for cotton or corn uh, than the minimally irrigated and 482 acres more than dry land. So as you go from maximizing your use of that irrigated resource to dry land, you're losing a considerable amount of money and you're losing jobs. So you're, you're losing about $479 an acre in gross outputs and about 7,300 jobs as you move to these different levels of use. So it's problematic. So we've got about 15 to 20 years to kind of solve or do something about this problem, knowing that uh, economically, it's it's you know more important for the the, the farm farmers and, and farm owners to actually utilize that water and 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 make um, as much as they possibly could, um, but without proactively altering the irrigated agriculture supported by groundwater from the southern southern Ogallala and by 2040. We know state and federal water agencies have predicted that producers will be forced to abandon some farms. So some are already, have already gone into dry land and there have been sporadic uh, situations where they have abandoned their farms. Um, but by 2040, that southern Ogallala area is going to be a pretty tough place to make a living um, where rain fed or dry land crop production is not economically feasible. So this abandoned farmland is a worrisome thing, and it's worrisome to the federal government. Um, and without intervention, that abandoned farmland reverts to go back land because we know that it doesn't go back to range land, folks, right? We don't see these abandoned farms going back to a nice, stable community of perennial plants that could support maybe grazing livestock or grazing wildlife or what have you. What it does is it goes back to go back lands which are dominated by invasive annual weeds that have poor soil holding capacity and, and leads eventually to dust bowl environment uh, like conditions. So this is one of Bill's um, um, project graphs showing the, the drop when you go to dry land and then if you convert the abandoned uh, farmland to pasture, to some kind of stable plant community that would support pasture. You're going to be losing money, folks. That's just the way it is. But you're also going to be retaining that soil surface, which is pretty critical. And so if we don't do something about that, we are going to lose that soil surface eventually because the weeds are just not going to hold that surface intact. And so we end up with, and this is a, a current photo of um, these dust storms that occur that will really just strip off the whatever soil surface we've built since the 1930s. So transitioning to this rain-fed um, dry land uh, agriculture or pasture causes economic impacts all along the value chain. We caught a glimpse of this in 1985 and I remember when I was at Texas A&M doing finishing up my PhD in 85, um, the southern Ogallala farmers were facing uh, greater irrigation pumping costs that exceeded the crop value and so they abandoned the cropland leaving go back conditions because they couldn't afford the pumpage. They had water, they just couldn't afford to pump it out. So, and what happened was dust bowl erosion was, was in some cases occurred and we had these dust storms. Now the dust bowl erosion that occurred in the 30s and 50s was checked by federal um, intervention. The, the feds went in and actually bought farmland and converted it to, to what are now the national grasslands, right? We have a series of national grasslands. Those national grasslands 
are really what, what the Fed converted from go-back uh, lands after the Dust Bowl situation. And in the 1980s, in this 85 period that I remember, when I was driving back from Texas A&M to California, going through that area, um, you know, that, that area and the, the reason that um, we didn't have Dust Bowl conditions after that is because they consolidated farms and they began to, to manage it for soil conservation again. So the estimated impact of this topic on rural prosperity is that highly productive land abandoned in those three states, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas, replaced by invasive weeds leading to dust bowl conditions. That's kind of the series that we see. Rural communities without that farm income cease to support associated community infrastructure, businesses, and industry. So we start losing our rural communities, which of course the federal government and particularly the Secretary of Agriculture is very interested in. Uh, the high likelihood of rural communities uh, needing to find alternative livelihoods in response to reduced land value, productivity, and water availability. So this is what's going to happen. So we, we, we begin to see these abandoned lands occur, convert to go back lands. Um, we start losing the soil surface. Um, we also can't support the infrastructure that was there that was supporting the irrigated agriculture um, activity. So we're going to have to think about coming up with a new idea because go back land is not inevitable, but the nature of agricultural production most likely is in the next 20 to 30 years, given the lack of irrigation water in that southern old Galala to grow commodity crops and the inability to economically convert to rain-fed agriculture on some areas. Now we can go into dry land if that's possible, if the soil has enough water holding capacity to make a crop that's economically supportable. But the, what we're going to have to have on those other areas where the potential for go-back is high, we're gonna to have to have research that will include the identification, restoration, and establishment of a sustainable perennial plant community. Grasses, forbs, shrubs, trees, whatever, using the last increment of irrigation water. So we need to try to convince the farmers not to evacuate every drop of the Ogallala aquifer in the southern Ogallala. We need them to hold that last increment in check so that we can establish, and I mean establish. We can, ger we can germinate a lot of things, uh, but really getting a plant community established that's sustainable enough to be able to convert to a different agricultural enterprise like grazing livestock um, is going to require some water, that last increment of water. So um, new technologies plus resurrecting old technologies used in the Dust Bowl era, in fact, you know, trying to figure out what kind of plant complexes we need to use uh, to, pr to pr protect productive land from wind erosion and maximize the adaptation to rain-fed conditions need to be considered. And the potential loss of productive land has, of course, economic and social dimensions that must be included in any effort to adapt ag to the impending lack of water. So, so these restoration actions and the establishment of a new agricultural enterprise based on forage production and livestock grazing must evolve, of course, farmers and their supporting communities, their local, regional, tribal, state, and federal decision makers to make this happen. Um, research issues related to the Ogallog Aquifer, the potential for this go-back land, and methods to support a viable ag enterprise include economic evaluation, particularly cost-benefit analysis, we're gonna have to see where it's economical to do a lot of these things, of restoring go-back lands with and without the last increment of stored groundwater. So, okay, so that's a mouthful, right? We're thinking about go-back lands. We're thinking about abandoned, abandoned farmland. We've seen that happen in 1985. They, the, some of the farmers did abandon their lands because they couldn't afford the pumpage. So we know what's going to happen. We, and so we've got some time. We have time to fix it. We have time to do something. And, and what I'm um, pitching is that we think about towards the end of the amount of water that's left 
is to give us some time to go in there and restore that back to some stable plant community that will be sustainable in the long run under climatic conditions that we have that could support a different agricultural enterprise and try to maintain <laughs> the communities, the rural communities and the support systems that supported the original irrigated agriculture activity. Now they may have to shift and change and what have you, but we, we want to have those communities there. We need them there. So we have a couple of projects that are actually working toward that. This OWCAP, this uh, Oglaw Water Cap project is working toward that. They're synthesizing and expanding knowledge related to optimizing water use. They're supporting the development and adoption of effective ag water management practices and tools. And they're looking at different tools like deficit irrigation um, and uh, looking at appropriate crop and land management irrigation timing, um, interannual variability and trying to un understand that better so that we can conserve more water. And it's working, it's, a lot of these things are working in the central and northern part to really conserve some water. Uh, yield variability, of course, the right plant, the right place with the right water. And, and you know, planning ahead and transitioning to less water. Uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? How is this going to be possible? How are we going to do it economically? How are we going to maintain those rural communities? Uh, and so we need, to, we need to use the Southern Ogallala as a test case to be able to make this happen, make it occur. And um, obviously Nebraska has some great ideas, this Lima idea, this, you know, the, the local enhanced management area where you focus attention on certain areas, um, all of a sudden you start getting conservation and you start seeing people using less water just because the focus is on, on their locale. We, and with this kind of activity, they've seen a 26% decrease in groundwater use in the study area with and without a Lima compared to the target area. Uh, water use has decreased. There's been shifts in the different crop types and uh, really no negative impact on cash flow. These are things that are going to work well in the central and northern part of the Ogallala, but the south is still, the southern part is still going to be problematic. The summit that we had in 20, was it 2018 or 2017? 2018. 2018. Okay, I did have the right date. Anyway, I really enjoyed this summit. I, I thought it was a great activity because we had so many producers and irrigation folk there and, and um, state and local representatives. I thought it was really well done. And, and, and we, we had a lot of really interesting ideas kicked around, including the one that you see up there um, where the sticky note uh, poster is. How do you make someone change their water use practices? Well, you set a groundwater production limit and hold their feet to the fire and show them that it pencils out. I mean, these, there were a lot of great ideas that were kicked around. Um, having data on water use and water levels is essential. Prioritizing maximum return on investment over maximizing yields. Um, the three-pronged approach that came up, peer-to-peer -peer exchange, industry engagement, academic evaluation and validation of tools and practices, modeling, for example. Dynamic deficit irrigation scheduling. You know, we've spent, I remember looking through um, the old awards that we had at, at CSRES and even before that at CSRS, you know, we've, we've kind of, our agency has changed names three times in the last 20 years and looking at those were really interesting because there were a lot of places where we had uh, spent almost 25 years studying irrigation scheduling but only 1% of the farming community was actually using it. But when you start focusing on certain areas and drought is an issue, all of a sudden the scheduling comes back as a viable tool. And then there's adaptation and improved water management that depends on policies and education to support BMPs. So look at the ogallalawater.org. Go, go to that website, take a, take a look at this funded project that's been going on for four years now. It's really spectacular, and it's going to be really providing a lot of good information and good technologies to
to the folks who farm the Ogallala. Another one, of course, is the one that Dan Devlin runs. Is Dan here anywhere? Where's Dan? There he is. All right, Dan, we're going to be talking about the, the Southern Great Plains Grazing Project right now because here's the thing. So I've been yakking about go back lands and converting that to some kind of stable community that might be supported by livestock grazing, for example, or supported, could support livestock grazing as an alternative uh, agricultural enterprise. Well, guess what? Dan Devlin and his team have, have really done an excellent job showing us how to do beef cattle production right. So they're managing these forage systems in a changing environment. Their focus was on climate change, carbon, greenhouse gas, and, and drought and water. So there we go. We can cherry pick a lot of information from that. Uh, they conducted research and they delivered extension programming about the impacts of weather, climate variability, and climate change on beef cattle production. And, you know, their long-term goals were to enhance resilience of beef grazing systems. So we can pull some information out of this project to be able to um, get us at least a couple steps ahead. We're not starting over thinking about what to put together as far as the plant community to support that livestock grazing in the southern Ogallala as that water um, is pumped out. They also protect um, production and ecosystem services and they're reducing GHG emissions at the same time. So they've collected two years of data measuring and monitoring storage and flux of water, carbon, and nitrogen in cow, calf, and stalker production systems across their research network. They've been looking at strategic planning for drought and heat, flash droughts, of course, uh, within year droughts, as well as agricultural drought, looking at these long-term southwestern droughts. You know, they've, they've fortunately for us, for me, I, I've seen they did a lot of work where they were actually having to deal with drought conditions, and that doesn't always happen. Um, you know, they've had wet years and dry years, and so things, things are those, those activities are going to be really helpful in delivering technologies that will help us to convert that agricultural enterprise in the southern Ogallala. Short-term outcomes included new knowledge and strategies, improved research extension frameworks, increased capacity, um, looking at emissions, producer stakeholders and extension professionals who understand climate issues, and policymakers have improved regional science-based information for decision-making. Their midterm outcomes was that the beef cattle industry is able to adjust management to respond to climate variability. Bingo, we can help, that'll help us. Evidence-based decision-making, um, improved regional and national GHG policy assessments, and looking at policies and procedures that are related to the cattle industry and land use in the Southern Great Plains, and acceptance and or adoption of approaches and practices, which is a key element. You know, we've got to have people on board to be able to get people to adopt these technologies that we develop and these new, these new concepts and ideas related to what has to happen in the next 20 to 30 years. Their long-term outcomes include increased resilience of beef cattle systems, the reduced GHG emissions, improved beef cattle production systems, next generation of researchers, ranchers, and farmers. Oh, that's gonna be great. Sustainable rural economies and increased capacity for research and extension. So we have two existing projects that are becoming mature that have a lot of great information to help us deal with a, ca a case, a use case like the Southern Ogallala. And so we need to be able to use these activities and move forward. So take a look at their website too, greatplainsgrazing.org, because there's some great stuff there too, and their newsletters are basically unsurpassed. These folks did an excellent job putting these newsletters together. There are some great technologies involved, some great modeling efforts involved, and um, hopefully both of these projects will extend beyond the life of their funding by USDA NIFA, and that they'll keep moving forward. So thank you very much. It's been great being here, and thanks for letting me spend a few minutes with you this morning. <laughs>